So this is the final portion of your training, your online course. And I've talked about a lot of investigative techniques throughout the different modules on how we investigate certain crimes, like with reversals operations, with street level buys. But um, I'm going to kind of recap some of that and just talk about some investigative techniques that we use um, in drug investigations. So let's say that you are a drug detective and um, I'm going to give you my, my scenario. Uh, I worked for the Phoenix Police Department Drug Enforcement Bureau, Neighborhood Narcotic Enforcement Team. And I was on a called a knock and talk squad, which our focus was actually consensual searches or basically resolving drug investigations without making undercover purchases. So it was called a knock and talk detail. And, but before we actually did like a consensual contact on a residence, we would exhaust all other avenues of investigation. So let's say you get a, a neighborhood narcotic complaint where there's somebody called in anonymously and they left a complaint. And, and just to give you an idea, when I worked drug enforcement, we would get five to 6,000 complaints a year about drug activity. So if there was a person like it, so if you ever have a situation where you want to report a drug house or a person selling drugs, like we keep all that confidential and you can trust that because if we didn't keep informants or information sources confidential, then nobody would give us information because nobody would trust us. I worked a lot of informants over the years and I kept their identity absolutely confidential. If it ever went to trial, they would drop a case before they would reveal a source. And that's just mainly to keep people safe and then also to get information. Because if you provided information on a Mexican cartel that you knew there was like major or a stash house down the street from you, and you're like, yeah, there's like a U-Haul shows up twice a week and backs up and, you know, at two in the morning and there's this suspicious activity going on. Just like that's the situation with that metric ton of marijuana in South Phoenix, like that U-Haul showed up twice a week and dropped off a metric ton. And that's, that was a stash house. So we keep all that information, um, confidential. So if you have 5,000 complaints a year, how do you filter through all that? Well, you look at who wants, like if there's a contact person, that's why I'm saying if you have a complaint of drug activity, say, yeah, you want to be contacted because if I, if I have all those complaints and they're anonymous, if they're anonymous and there's really good information that doesn't take me real long, like there's name, vehicle, description, plate number, address, I can start researching and say, oh yeah, John Jones. Yeah. He lives there. Yeah. He drives this car and oh, here's what he's doing. Okay. Well, I have a lot of information to start with. Um, now I just need to go out and do some surveillance and see if the information I've received can be validated or confirmed. And so just because somebody calls in, cause let's say you want to be vindictive, right? And you wanted to call in on your old boyfriend or girlfriend and say, Oh yeah, they're a drug dealer. Well, that doesn't mean that they're just, we're going to cause havoc and go arrest them and all that. No, you have to have evidence. That's like, we're, we're presumed innocent until proven guilty. Right. And so evidence is what determines a person's guilt or not in a court of law. And that's what we have to operate under. That's what our, that protects all of us from false accusations. So you have a drug complaint and you, there's a name on there. So let's say there's a house at 500 East McDowell it says there's a lot of activity, people coming and going on foot, vehicle, bicycle. They only stay for two to five minutes. And I, and I believe that they're selling drugs. So that activity of foot traffic, bike traffic, vehicle traffic in that area, people staying two to five minutes. That's pretty like str a strong indication of a drug house because what else would cause a lot of traffic to a house consistently. And they'll usually give the time of day, like all day long, or usually happens in the evening. So like 90%, that's, that's most likely a drug house based on the activity that was described. So that means, okay, is there a contact person? So I call that person, Hey, uh, detective Fredrickson, drug enforcement bureau, calling up on the information to, that you reported. Um, is it still going on? Uh, what else can you tell me? 
um, am I able to use like your driveway or your house to do surveillance from? Because if it's in a drug neighborhood and it's a lot of foot traffic and vehicle traffic, like the inner city, uh, urban environment, a lot of times it's hard to get a really good surveillance eye unless you get an elevated position, you're far enough away to not draw attention. But if there's a lot of foot traffic, I mean, if you're familiar with some of the neighborhoods downtown, like immediately downtown, like Jefferson, uh, it's really hard to park and watch activity without drawing the attention of the people that live on the streets. There's prostitution, there's drug dealers, and they're looking for clients, so they're going to notice you. So I'll, I'll go out and do surveillance. And first I'll run up whatever activity I can on the house. Who lives there? Is it a rental? Uh, did the person provide me vehicle plate? So if I t contact somebody that provided information, I'll say, hey, do me a favor. If they didn't give me license plates, I'll say, get me some vehicle descriptions and license plates of who lives at the house. And then also grab me a couple plates if you can do safely of people that like a regular person that comes to the house. So all this is called intelligence. And I, and the more intelligence you have, the more of a better decision you can make on, on what's going on. And the more you have when you start investigating it. So the first thing I'll do is go out and do surveillance. I'll see like, is the information provided? Does it seem consistent with what I'm seeing? And I might go out there different times of the day. And that's why I ask them, when is it busiest? Oh, it's like from seven to nine, like it's constant. So I'll go out there from seven to nine and watch it and see the activity. And, um, when I'm doing surveillance, I'll say, you know what, maybe I'll follow a car away and, or when vehicles are showing up, if it's me and my partner, I'll say, Hey, give me license plate numbers. We'll run the license plates and, Oh, there's a suspended license plate. Okay. That I can stop that vehicle for a traffic violation. So the vehicle leaves followed away far enough away so that I'm not pulling it over the car over a block away and people from the house know, or people from the neighborhood know, I'll follow it out of the area, get a traffic stop, contact the, the driver, find out if there's a reason to arrest them. Again, this is an investigation. I'm not, I don't violate people's rights. Like I don't stop people unless I have a valid reason to stop them. I don't arrest them if I don't have a valid reason to arrest them. And so let's say, we stop them for a valid reason. I don't have a reason to arrest them. So, and the arrest allows you to search the person and the, usually the immediate area of the car. And then I can look for what I think is drugs that they just purchased. So if they don't, if I can't arrest them, I'll just ask them consent, right? Like, Hey, do you mind if I search your vehicle? Oh, no problem. And I record all this, like this is all recorded nowadays with body cams. Um, a lot of it's recorded video wise as well. That was before like video, video and body cams and all that came after I left. So if I was doing it today, I'd, I'd record it with a video camera. And that's so you can record the consent of the driver. So he can't go to court later if you find drugs and he, and, and he would say, uh, detective Fredrickson violated my rights. Like I never told him he could search my car. Oh, well here it is on video. So it protects me and it also protects the driver or, or whoever, I'm dealing with. So I ask for consent, search the car. And again, if it's a crack house, which like high activity like that is, is a lot of times a crack house. But again, nowadays you have, um, drug houses that are poly drug houses where again, you can get meth, marijuana, crack, cocaine, cocaine, uh, heroin, if I didn't mention it. So you can get all types of different drugs, right? So I'll ask for consent. If I don't find anything in the car and it's a crack house, where's that crack rock usually? Right in the mouth. That's usually where they're storing it. So when I'm all done and search the car, there's nothing. Search them, there's nothing. Last thing. And I'm telling you, they, they, they're they not going to swallow that rock and, unless they have to. Because it's in their mouth. It's safe. So I'll say, hey, uh, nothing here. I appreciate your cooperation and everything. Um, but before I let you go, can you do me a favor? Can, can you show me inside your mouth? And sometimes they'll go and the crack rocks under their tongue, right? They'll be like, and I'll say, lift up your tongue. And then that's when they go to swallow it because they're hiding it under their tongue. And 
like it, unless you've done this a hundred times, like it, it sounds like pretty foreign, like, Oh really? But yeah, I'm telling you, that's pretty much, that's the way it is on the street. They're not going to swallow a $20 rock unless they have to. Why? Cause they worked hard for that rock most likely. And, and they're not going to just swallow it for nothing. So let's say I find a rock on them and I'm like, okay, um, who'd you buy this crack from? Well, and I, and I don't tell them necessarily like, Hey, I just followed you from the house because if I tell them, Hey, I just followed you from this house and I say, Hey, where'd you get this crack rock from? And they say, Oh, I just got from the house that I left. Then it's kind of like I've, they could in court, it could be construed that I gave them that idea. So I don't, I don't tell them that I'm following them from the house, right? It's traffic stop. Hey, do you have anything? Do you mind if I look? Oh, you have this rock. Hey, where'd you get this crack rock? If they independently say, well, um, I actually, I just bought it. Where'd you buy it from? Um, that whole house over at fifth street and McDowell, it's on the corner. These people don't know addresses. Usually they just know it as a described house. So, uh, I'll say, we'll describe the house. And when they describe it, it'll be the house I was watching. So now I have them independently saying where they bought it from without me saying, I, I watched you do it. So it just makes it more credible. So I'll say, okay, um, like, who'd you buy it from? What's his name? What does he look like? And then I'll start getting all the information I can about their, the, the process or the method of them selling drugs. Like, um, when you bought it, where, where'd they get the crack from? And sometimes they'll say, oh, like, you know, it's in a little Altoids tin or um, they keep it in a drawer in a bag or they keep it up on top of a counter, you know, a, a shelving unit. So now a lot of times buyers don't see where it comes from. Like they might see, like they might see immediately where it comes from, but they don't see where the stash is at. And that's because drug dealers don't want them to see where their stash is at. So I'll get all the information I can from the, from this person that bought from that house and I'll get all the information I can. Now that, that enough, the fact that he independently said they bought drugs from that house and here's the drug I tested it's crack cocaine. Like I have enough to draw a search warrant on that house based on what I, what I have there. But what we try to do is get, um, three confirmations to, to solidify it, to confirm like, um, like there's no doubt this house is selling drugs. So I usually will stop another person, go through the same routine or, um, I'll do it like a, uh, I'll take their trash depending on like in that neighborhood with a crack house, I'm not going to take their trash because most likely there, there's nothing in there that's going to tell me like there's no drug paraphernalia that's going to be disposed of with a meth house. Like if, if it's a meth lab, I did, um, they're called trash rips or trash runs. Basically when somebody puts their trash out to the street to be picked up by the disposal, garbage disposal company, like the courts have ruled that that's abandoned trash. You put it out at the street. That means they're getting rid of it and they don't have any expectation of, of privacy in that garbage can. So with meth labs, that was standard procedure. Like if you had a meth lab or a drug, like a meth, um, dealer house, like you'd take their trash, um, anytime you could, and you'd just schedule it when the trash went out. Sometimes we'd actually go down and, and get a truck from the city of Phoenix garbage disposal, little, a little white pickup with the bird on the door that said, um, you know, waste department, whatever it might be, put on the coat and actually take a garbage can out there that looked just like theirs and swap it out. Take their whole garbage can, put, give them a new one. And, uh, we'd usually do it late at night. I got caught once and there were tweakers and it was about uh, two in the morning. We did a trash run and I saw the blinds go up cause I could see the light coming out and they saw, and I'm like, they caught us. Like they caught us taking their garbage so when you do a trash run, a lot of times you have somebody covering while you do it for safety. So we took the trash, we left, we knew we got spotted. And so sure enough, the, um, the guy left back there doing surveillance, 
um, was watching, he said the guy came out and looked up and down the street, looked in his trash can, and all of a sudden you could tell he was agitated. So meanwhile, we got the trash can though, right? So we start going through the trash can, and there's meth lab stuff like crazy in it. So now we actually have enough to write a search warrant on the house. We have evidence of drugs, like drug manufacturing from the house. So what you got to do though is like you have to contain the house. Like um, there's something called creating an exigency where you have exigent circumstances that um, are outside of Fourth Amendment laws, which means if there's an exigency created, you can actually like lock down and freeze everything, freeze it until you get a search warrant. So a guy came out in a truck, um, got in the truck and left, and we got that individual stopped. And he said, yeah, they're like, they're like cleaning up the house right now. And we're like, okay, because we were just going to basically contain it until we got a search warrant drawn and make sure no evidence left. And he actually had um, some meth lab equipment with him. So now we're, when he's like, yeah, they're cleaning up the house, we're like, okay, they saw us take the trash. A guy's leaving with evidence. And he said, there's others cleaning up the house. Like we need to lock this thing down. So we called patrol units, went into the house and basically froze everything until the search warrant was drawn. And then, you know, we did our interviews and all that. So that's a trash run. And you can get a lot of evidence out of taking somebody's trash. And, you know, we use it in a lot of different investigations, not just drug dealing, but um, like retail theft, burglary, um, sex crimes, homicide, like, like every investigative unit can um, benefit from taking somebody's trash like we did it on a homicide suspect when i worked the homicide drug task force the red rum unit and like twice a week there was de detectives dedicated to take the trash twice a week and they'd go through there and you literally could see what was going on in their entire life i mean like you knew when she dyed her hair you knew pretty much where they spent money you knew when she had like enhancements done to her body uh, you, like you knew everything about this couple and the, the husband was actually, uh, he was actually had killed like two or three people. He was, he was a bad dude. So anyways, um, so that's a investigative technique is, is taking people's trash and looking through it. I mentioned the surveillance following people away. So I mentioned, we usually try to get three, three confirmations of criminal activity. So I'll usually try to um, contact three people that leave. And, and there's a lot of foot traffic in some of those urban crack houses downtown. And so a lot of the times they were on foot and I just follow them until they're far enough away. And then I'd basically park and get out and contact them on foot. And then you're not even dealing with a whole car issue. And it's just like, Hey, do you mind if I talk to you for a moment? It's a consensual contact on the street. And if they say, no, I don't want to talk to you and they keep walking, then that you can't do anything about that. So it's a consensual contact. You say, hey, mind if I talk to you for a moment? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Most people will talk to you. I mean, it's, if you're, if you, um, if you're fair and you build a rapport and you're not intimidating and threatening and you're just, um, act really cool, people will talk to you. And so I'll basically go through the whole thing again. Uh, where are you coming from? Um, and if they lie and all that, I'll say, hey, you know what? Let's just like, like cut the bull. Like I I'm watching that house back there. If they basically deny everything, I'll throw down the house and say, I saw you go there and leave. And then now they know that, you know, and so, um, and, and what I'll tell them is, Hey, like you're a user, same thing with a car stop. Hey, you're a user. Uh, I'm not interested in using like there's, there's millions of users. Like in the Phoenix, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of users. Like, I don't have time to just spend going after and arresting and booking users. I said, I want to know who's man making manufacturing, who's dealing. So i um, tell you what, did you buy from back there? Yeah. Okay. I'll say, um, you know, and usually I'll say something like, Hey, cause you can't make promises that you can't follow through, but I'll just say, you know, I'm interested in, in, who's selling this stuff. I'm not interested in booking and putting people in jail that are users, 
but I need to get information and intelligence. And that's where I think you can help me out. So can you help me out? Yeah. Okay. Did you buy something? Yeah. Where is it? They spit it out, right? How much did you pay for it? Who'd you buy it from? So um, that's all intelligence again. And if you have uh, drugs or any um, any um, evidence of a crime coming out of a house, you have probable cause to write a search warrant to go in that house and search it. And that's that's what we did on the knock and talk unit. The other units were predominantly undercovers, long hair, beards, tattoos, earrings. I mean, they basically did undercover purchases. And sometimes if we did surveillance and, um, you know, there was like a new a new uh, narcotics detective, they have to go out and make purchases. And so a lot of times, um, you know, if we're doing surveillance on a house and it's really active, we'll say, hey, um, you know, Bob's brand new. Um, this, I got a really active house over here. Do you want to have Bob make a, a buy here? And they'll send Bob over and they always go in pairs and um, somebody will watch and Bob will go and do a buy. And if they do a buy, again, they actually did a hand-to-hand with the person and the, they have enough to write a search warrant on the house. But again, the um, the dealer they bought from, they usually try to get three purchases on a person in a house as well, just because then they can say, this person is a seller. They're, they just didn't happen to be over for dinner and they you know did the sale because they were there. No, you get three buys and you show that th- three times is pretty strong evidence that they're a seller. Um, so, you know, I mentioned when I did my um, hand-to-hand buy with that um, African-American dude on the street and he put the, he's like, he goes, what do you want? I go, I go, I want rock. He goes, how much? I go, 20 bucks. He goes, put your money down on the street. Put my money down. He took, a, spit out his rock, put his rock on the street or a sidewalk and took my 20. And as soon as he did that, I knew that he'd been arrested before for a hand-to-hand deal. Because that's what they're called in a police report. That subject A con- conducted a hand-to-hand sale with an undercover detective. And so what he was doing by saying, put your money down. And then he put his rock down and took my money. He didn't do a hand-to-hand. It wasn't hand-to-hand. It was hand-to-sidewalk. Which it, it has absolutely nothing to do with a hand-to-hand deal that's just terminology that we use hand-to-hand deal um and then also like some people think if they that we can't lie like we can definitely lie to elicit um um, a confession out of a person but obviously the lie would be um you know a defense attorney could could basically say oh you lied to my client but what I'm getting at here is a lot of times they'll say, are you a cop? Are you under, are you an undercover cop? Or are you a cop? Or are you Popo? Or are you five O? Whatever it might be. And they think that you have to tell them the truth. Like that that's not true. So if they're like, oh, are you a cop? And you say, no, and you buy drugs. Like you, you can lie in those situations. What are you going to do? Say, oh yeah, um, you got me. I, I'm a cop. Okay, well, I ain't going to sell it to you, whatever. So, if you've ever heard that or seen that, like, that has nothing to do with anything. Like, we actually, during interviewing, like, let's say we have two or three suspects that did a, a burglary, and none of them are talking. We'll go to one and say, hey, Joe and Mark, that you were with, Joe's saying you're the one that busted that door open. And then Joe's like, oh, he thinks those guys are rolling on him. He's like... No, like I, Mark's the one that busted that door open, man. Like he busted the door open. Um, they ain't going to put this on me. And so I lied because none of them were talking. But I said, hey, they said, you're the one that busted the door. Now, let's say he did bust the door. And they're like, and he's like, he's like, well, yeah, yeah, I did bust the door open. But you know what? They're the ones that, that drilled into the safe, you know, so you can lie to elicit, elicit confessions and use basically pit one defendant against the other. Okay, so we talked about undercover purchases. We talked about doing surveillance. We talked about trash runs. Talked about consensual contacts where you ask for consent. Uh, You can also develop informants. So let's say a guy leaves. I stop him. He says, yeah, I bought drugs back at the house. 
uh, Fifth Street McDowell, I can say, tell you what, um, I, I can put you in jail or you can work with me. It's your choice. Are you willing to go back there and introduce a cop into that house? And like an undercover cop. Sometimes they get really leery on this. They're like, oh man, I don't know. Because they picture like some cop like me, right? Like, oh, I'm going to introduce some halfway clean cut dude into a house. Like that puts them at risk. But you say, you know, no, man, like we have undercovers. We'll keep you protected. All you have to do is bring somebody with you. And it's called an intro. With crack houses, you don't need an intro so much because crack houses that are run by Mexican cartels, they'll just like sell. Like they, if you got money, they'll sell to you. Um, if they think you're a cop, they won't sell. Sometimes, and we actually, I mentioned like I've had two guys I worked with that went into drug houses to make purchases. Maybe I didn't mention this. One of them actually had a gun put to his head and, and, um, they made him smoke crack. They're, they're like, Pepe, Pepe, you know, hit the pipe. And if you have a gun to your head, like you're going to do it. Like, but, um, so he did. I mean, he hit the pipe, then he went to the hospital and he actually ended up leaving drug enforcement not that long after because uh, it was pretty traumatic for him to be forced to smoke a drug. And he was married and had kids and it affected him. I had another um, detective friend that went in and they basically pull out shotguns and they said, Are you cops? No, we're not cops. And they intent threatened him with the shotguns, but they didn't make him smoke or anything. But they sold him the drugs, and then when they got out, were like, they were pissed. So, um, so those things happen. But um, cops don't use or undercover detectives like anywhere in the country. Law enforcement does not use a drug to basically get evidence. Like you can't commit a crime to get evidence. So, like in the movies where some cop is undercover deep, and he's like, you know, taking hits and smoking whatever to prove he's not a cop that's all false that doesn't happen so because uh, you can't that that's first of all the uh, pl the police department's not going to support it because you're using drugs and um there's the only time you'd ever do that is like i said when your life is threatened you don't have any other option so we have informants that basically can introduce undercover cops into a person or a group or a location because an intro basically kind of builds like, it's like if you introed your friend, like, Hey, you know, um, whatever it might be, I'm trying to think of a good example of where you, you might say, Hey, I got a really good discount at this clothing store. Um, like the secondhand clothing store, like just mention my name or he'd tell you what, I'll bring you in. So you go with your friend and they're like, Oh yeah, I'll give you a 20% discount on this secondhand clothing at Plato's closet or wherever. Um, cause you're friends. And so it's like an intro just like that. So the other way, way informants can work is if, uh, your informant can be an information source where they get their intelligence for you. And, but you have to keep them anonymous. So let's say they go into a house and they're like, like, um, like, let's say the guy, so they're all, they're all considered information sources, um, or informants, kind of the same thing. An information source could be a caller, um, but they could also be referred to as an informant. An informant typically is somebody that you work with over a period of time. You actually sign them up as an informant. They are either working off charges or maybe you pay them. <coughs> so let's say, um, and I actually worked some informants that were uh, like... <laughs> Informants have different motivations and like you can never trust an informant. Sometimes they're motivated by um, jealousy. They're motivated by revenge. They're motivated by like a good Samaritan. Like they just want to do good and provide information. Um, some of them are motivated by money. So they have different motivations. And what you got to do when you're working with an informant is identify what is their motivation is it to get out of a charge that you arrested him for or somebody else did? Okay, that's a motivation. So um, I had a had a girlfriend, not my girlfriend. I had a girlfriend informant of an of an ex marijuana trafficker, and she was crazy. And she was giving me information. She was like, "Yeah, he's got three hundred pounds of marijuana in the in the apartment right now." I go, oh, "Okay," like, and I found out she was a previous informant for for vice matter of fact vice is the one that gave it gave it to me 
they're like, hey, we got this girl. She says his boy, her boyfriend. He was kind of an ex-boyfriend, but he was still, she was with him. But he was kind of like seeing other girls. And so she was really pissed. And so Vice gave it to me and they're like, hey, just FYI, she's a little crazy, but she's been good with her information. So I had to deal with this crazy woman who said, yeah, he's got 300 pounds of marijuana in his closet. I'm like, okay, I want you to like, what would you do? If he's got 300 pounds of marijuana, take pictures. The pictures aren't going to fly because they might not really be marijuana. So I said, okay, get me some marijuana. Like, do you have access to it? Does, is it any of it open? And she's like, oh, I can get, I can get marijuana. So I had her get me a sample of marijuana from his apartment. Like we watched, we, so here's the other thing. When you get evidence from an informant, you have to watch them, like go and do it and come back because, um, they can't just show up one day and say, here it is because I can't prove where it came from. So we, she wrote, uh, I can't remember. I think she drove separately. We set up surveillance. She drove there. She went to the apartment. We watched her go in first. You search them. So we searched her, nothing on her Searched her car. Yeah. She drove separate. We searched her car to make sure there's nothing in there. Gave her money. Well, actually, no, we didn't even give her money. That was kind of the awkward thing is like, you normally you give them money. I use undercover funds, give them money to buy the drugs, the stolen property, whatever your evidence is that you're looking for. And so you give them the money, but this, she was just going to get a sample. So how do you, like, it was a little tricky on writing it up because if she's the only one that has access to his apartment and the drugs, and I write up a search warrant, like, how do I protect her when she got me a sample of marijuana? Because, um, like how many people had access if it's only her and I write a search warrant and I hit the apartment and I say, yeah, a, a information source was able to get me a sample of marijuana and she's the only one. Well, it, it's pretty obvious who it was and you have to protect your informants. So I don't even remember how we wrote it up. Um, I think we had her get, uh, a sample over and, and I think she had said that <coughs> other people had access to the apartment and that he, you know, regularly provided marijuana to his friends and all that. And th this guy, like he was not your typical drug dealer at all. He was a, he was a professional. I don't want to say professional sports player, but in another country, he was a top level soccer player. And he, um, was getting older and he was getting injured and he couldn't perform anymore. Um, like make money as much doing soccer. And so he's really struggling. And that's how he got into this uh, marijuana smuggling. But the guy was a, just a, a nice guy, a professional. Um, <coughs> I just fell under hard times. Hang on. And I actually felt pretty bad. I think he ended up getting probation out of it, but he's a really nice guy. Like he's a guy that I could be a friend with and just talk with normally. And he was into, into sports into working out and training and all that. And he just, again, he found her hard times, um, saw an opportunity to make some money and started, um, trafficking in marijuana and he was just shipping it larger quantities. So you have to write up your search warrant to protect your informant. So you basically say like on or about September 11th, 2018 and on or about, or within the past three weeks or two weeks or four weeks or within the past month, like basically you create the biggest window you can to protect your information source. So like if somebody's going and doing drug buys and I search them, they go do a drug buy, give them money. They do a drug buy, they come back, they give me the drugs. I search them again to make sure that they, uh, for whatever reason that they're not trying to set this person up. And, um, and they actually went to that place. So like you have to do surveillance to, to, it's like a chain of custody for the evidence they're obtaining. Um, so anyways, that's pretty much, um, informants and informants will drive you absolutely nuts, man. They're like, they're, they're really good with information, but they're, they're informants for a reason because they're usually a criminal. They're involved in drug activity. They're involved in theft. I actually had a guy that. Um, I worked as an informant for doing, um, retail theft, like major retail theft. And I had a tracker on him and I caught him doing the theft 
I left my tracker on his, on his van. And I said, Hey, like, cause we were actually after his buddy who did a burglary and, um, they were partners. And so he was supposed to give up his buddy that was doing the burglary, like where he was hiding out and where all the stolen goods were. Like he hit a storage locker for some sporting event that was, uh, in Phoenix. And it was a whole bunch of sports memorabilia, like, like, tens of thousands of dollars worth. And we were trying to figure out where it was, but I turned him into an informant. I had charges on him and I told him, I said, you can't be doing out. You can't be doing your theft anymore. Like, like just get me the information on where this guy is and where the property is. And, um, uh, I left my tracker on his truck. Well, I, I, and that was like, cause I didn't totally trust him. And so and my gut feeling was correct because I actually looked at his history and cause he was at it. So what it was is he ended up at an apartment complex and he wasn't calling me back. Uh, like typical, right? Like they blow you off. So I found his van at an apartment complex cause I was tracking him and I went and looked in the van. Um, cause he was known to live out of his van. I looked in there and there was a huge, like 50 inch TV in a brand new box in the back seat of this van. And I'm like, this dude doesn't even have a house. Like he lives out of his van pretty much like where'd he get a 50 inch TV. So I looked at his tracks and it turns out he is at a Walmart store in the middle of the night up in Anthem. So I go up to the Walmart store and I'm like, Hey, I think this, this flat screen came from your store. Cause, uh, I'm, I have a suspect that I believe was up here. Can you check your video? So they look at their video and basically see this guy and that partner that he's supposed to be giving me, given up to me, right? They go into the Walmart and they buy a set of bolt cutters, like literally bought a set of bolt cutters. The outside camera show them cutting a lock into an outside outside storage section of the Walmart, um, like the garden area or something. And they actually, so they basically in the store, they grab this TV and a bunch of other stuff and shoved it into the garden center, you know, through holes in the, under the grates and everything or the gates. And then they grew up, went in and bought bolt cutters, cut the bolt to the garden center, went in, because it's not alarmed in there apparently, and retrieved all their stuff. So they committed a burglary. Like they basically put the the TV and all those items into an area, and then they basically bought bolt cutters from Walmart, cut it, went in there. So they, he did a burglary. And like this dude was a, like, he had just gotten out of prison. And so he was looking to go back to prison if he didn't, you know, follow through with working for me. And all I wanted is where this guy was here. He is with the guy doing a burglary at a Walmart and blew and totally blew me off. So I arrested him, interviewed him. He ended up going to prison for 10 years, but that's just an example of how you cannot trust informants. And he had a, he had a meth addiction. As a matter of fact, um, his name was Richard Burns and his, so I remember him because I actually, when I worked meth labs before I, I put him in prison for, for, um, making meth at a hotel and he left and forgot it cooking. And it actually started a fire in the hotel, extended suites, America, I 17 and, um, Rose garden. And his name was Dick Burns. And I'm like, Dick Burns, like that's something you don't ever forget. So all of a sudden he went to prison, got out of prison. And now he's, um, like he, he became a target for, for, um, for me in the repeat offender program because he was uh, a retail, like a hardcore retail theft. So anyways, he's back, he's back in prison. So that's, uh, so that's informants. So, um, then there's the search warrants I mentioned. And the only other thing I want to touch on before we close this out, um, we're at about 38 minutes is knock and talks at a resident. So, so I told you that you exhaust almost every investigative opportunity you can from outside of a location, right? You do surveillance, you do trash rim runs, um, you do research, <coughs> you do everything you can. Let's say you follow people away or there's just no activity. Like you, you sit there for two days and this is real typical with, with drug labs is there won't be much activity. And same with marijuana grows, hardly any activity. Like I, I got some really good anonymous tips on marijuana grows, but there's no activity. And, and that's because those locations, 
they try to keep traffic away because they don't want to draw attention to the location. So if it's a clan lab location, first of all, there's cameras all over the place. I'm sitting out there. I don't, let's say I'm doing some trash runs, but um, I'm not getting anything. Or on a lot of meth labs, they won't put their trash out. They'll actually take their trash and go dump it somewhere else, like in a dumpster. And that was actually really common. The smart ones would do that. The dumb ones just threw it in their trash can. So let's say I'm doing surveillance and there's nothing going on. Like I've been, I spent three, four days, um, different times of the day. I'm not getting any evidence out of it. Then I'll do what's called a knock and talk. I'll basically grab a partner. We'll put on, uh, I'll conceal my weapon. I'll put on a polo shirt like this that says, um, neighborhood narcotic enforcement team with a Phoenix police logo and I'll record it and I'll go knock on their door. Door opens. Hey Bob, um, I'm with the Phoenix police department and uh, we got some information of, of possible. Well, so usually I'll say, Hey, I'm with the police department. Uh, do you mind if I come in and talk to you? Like my, my objective is to try to observe any evidence or get admissions of what's going on. So I'll say, Hey, um, I'm with the Phoenix police department and I have some questions I need to ask you. Do you mind if we step inside? So the neighborhood doesn't hear. And sometimes they'll see Sometimes. Yeah. Come on in. Let's talk. Or, um, no, I'll come out and talk to you. So now we're standing outside the front door. If I get inside the house and I'm talking to this person, my partner's number one objective is basically to look around and scan and look for anything of drug paraphernalia or evidence of to support the complaint we have. Like, are they cooking drugs? Is there anything out that would indicate they're cooking drugs? Or are they a drug dealer? Is there anything out? And a lot of times these complaints are users. And again, we're not going to waste our time on users. So we need to differentiate really quick. Like, are they selling or are they using? So I'll say, hey, got information. You're possibly selling drugs. Like, and I'll really beef it up. Like, um, yeah, they're saying that they're, you're possibly a drug dealer and all that. And so I don't know if you're a drug dealer or a user. I mean, do you use a little bit? So I made it really big, like, oh, big drug dealer. But then I'll downplay it, like, do you maybe just use a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, in their mind, they're like, I'm a drug dealer. But you're, like, giving them an out. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I use a little bit. Oh, okay, cool. Like, how much, you know, what do you use? How much do you use? How do you use it? Oh, I smoke a little bit of weed. Oh, really? Meanwhile, they could have a lab cooking in the back bedroom. Uh, so you smoke a little weed? Yeah. How do you smoke it? Uh, on a pipe. Well, like, where's your pipe? Uh, oh, it's in my pocket. Whew. They pull it out. Like, right in, as soon as they give up any evidence of drug paraphernalia or drugs, like, I have basically enough to write a search warrant on that whole place. I could literally freeze it and lock it down. But I don't. Because, again, I don't know if they're a drug dealer or a user. So I'll say, oh, great. Pipe. Oh, uh, no big deal. You know, I'll have to take that as a, you know, you're not supposed to have paraphernalia, but do you have any marijuana that goes with a pipe? Um, yeah, I got a little bit. Oh, where is it? Oh, it's in my bedroom. Well, how, how much is it? Oh, it's just a gram or, oh, it's a tiny amount. Well, okay. We'll tell you what, um, do, do you mind grabbing that? Like, um, I, I just need to differentiate whether you're, you're a dealer or user. Oh yeah, no big deal. I'll go get it. Well, can we come with you just for safety? Like, I don't know you. I don't know if there's other people. Are there anybody else in the house? No, no, just me. Okay, let's go to the back room. Okay, oh, there's the marijuana. Oh, okay, is that all you got? Yeah. So now I have a pipe and I have marijuana. And the number one thing I'm doing is I'm looking at their behavior. Like, are they starting to sweat? Are they getting really nervous, really guarded? Like, are they starting to close up? Or are they like, eh, no big deal. So I'm looking for body language, big time. So I get in the back room, there's his weed, and and it looks like he used a quantity. And while I'm there, maybe I see a scale on the counter or the dresser that he, you know, he didn't know I was coming, so he didn't have any reason to hide it. So if I see a scale, now things are, it's now like we're at a whole different level. Like a user doesn't have a scale. So then I'll say, hey, um, that you got a scale. They're like, what's that for? Oh, you know, usually they'll say, oh, I weigh, I weigh jewelry. Oh really? Oh yeah. Yeah. I weigh gold. They, they always say the, the same thing. I weigh jewelry. Um, I'm like, whatever. I've never seen people weigh jewelry or golds and all that, but that's the only explanation they have for a scale. So I'll say, okay, well, um, 
you know, uh, do you have any more drugs? No, no, no. Well, do you mind if I, you know, do you mind if I look in your dresser here or whatever? And if they're like, oh, well, no, I don't want you to look anymore. Like, um, I don't feel comfortable. So then I know they're usually hiding something. And so I'll say, okay, we'll tell you what, like, I can't go back to my boss. You've already shown that there's marijuana, there's a scale there. Like, I can't go back to my boss and, and resolve this complaint because I don't know if you're really a dealer or a user. And if I can't look, then I'm pretty much, my only option is to get a search warrant. And so then we'll pretty much say, okay, let's go out in the living room, sit down. I get it on the radio or a phone. And I say, hey guys, like I'm going to do a search warrant on this place. They all come over. We sit there, I write a search warrant and then I search. And sometimes when I'm writing, when I'm like, okay, I, I needed to get a search warrant. Then sometimes they're like, well, you don't have to do that. And I'm like, well, no, it's your right. I can get, I have to get a search warrant. Um, unless you want to give me consent, but you already told me to stop. And if, if you want me to stop, I'm going to stop. And if they're like, no, 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 man, it's, it's not a big deal. Just go ahead and look. Then I'll break out a consent form and I'll say, okay, like I want you to know, cause in court he's going to say, I never gave him consent. So I'm going to say like, here's a consent form. And I'm telling you, like you can require me to get a search warrant. Um, you don't have to give me consent. And they'll be like, no, no, just I'll sign it. And, so if I feel like it's not a big deal, then I'll do that and I'll let them sign it and I'll say, okay, what do you, what do you got? Uh, I just, I got like six dime bags. I, I sell a little bit. I'm not a big dealer. And it's like, okay, no big deal. Like when people are really cool with me, I don't book them in a jail. I'm just like, I take it, I write it up, I leave. It's when they, um, cop attitudes and all that kind of stuff that I'm like, you know what? I'll treat you how you treat me. If you want to have an attitude, then you can go spend a night in jail or, or whatever. So I did knock and talks for, well, I did knock and talks for probably three, four years, like almost constantly. And, and then I transitioned into um, drug labs, but I did knock and talks with drug labs. Like I, nothing shifted other than I was, I was on a um, clan lab task force. So anytime a lab came out, I would respond to it or any clan lab investigations came to me. So I would work drug lab investigations and then other investigations. So that's pretty much, um, that's pretty much it. Like I covered almost everything with investigative techniques. We talked about a lot of it during different modules. Um, one question almost every class asks is, and I'm assuming you're probably wondering too, like, what do you do with all the money and the, the cars and all the C stuff? And, and what do you do with the drugs? Like, what do you do with seized drugs? So I'll put that one at rest. All the money seized, all the assets, cars, houses, and all that, they, they get like cars get auctioned off cash gets seized. Like you have to actually do a civil forfeiture, um, packet and it goes to a civil forfeiture court. And so like, just like if you had something seized from you and it was not seized properly or legally, you would contest it just like money. We seized at the airport. Like the biggest seizure was 250,000 in cash in two suitcases. And we seized it based on the guy had a drug nexus. Mean there was drug drugs in his history. But we, when we seize it, we still give him a right. We gave everybody a right, like to contest what was seized. And just to let you know, we don't willy nilly go out and seize cars for doobie doobies and pipe. Like it's really hard to seize something. Um, unless you have a lot of evidence or support that it's a drug dealer. Like we don't seize things for drug users. There are some jurisdictions out in the U S that are podunk little police departments that will seize things for stupid little things. And, and that's on them. I can, I'm just telling you from my experience in Phoenix with our Maricopa County attorney's office to seize things wasn't an easy task. And whenever we did, we definitely had a lot of evidence. So out of the $2 million or so that seized every year going through Phoenix international airport, how many, like how many people do you think can test all that, all those seizures? Like what percentage? It's like less than 5%. As a matter of fact, um, usually it's not contested at all. Like they don't even go to the hearing and try to contest it because they, they know that money is drug money and they have no way to prove where that money came from. So the drugs, so all that money assets, it basically, um, 
goes to the court system and, and goes through civil hearings. And then it's awarded, it's called court awarded funded money that goes back to the city and the county prosecutor's office. And all the overtime I worked, and I worked like hundreds and hundreds of hours of overtime a year, all of that overtime was paid for by seized money and assets from drug dealers. So that's one part that they never tell you about with, with the war on drugs. Like all the money government spends, government seizes a lot of cash and assets from drug traffickers. And all that money goes back to fight that war, if you want to call it. There is no war on drugs, just to let you know. No war on drugs. But the money does go back to help us with overtime, equipment, training. When I went to Quantico for all my training, I've been there three times. Quantico, Virginia, the FBI Academy, all that was federally funded from federally, like federal seizures of drug or money assets. So where does the drug go or the drugs that are seized? The drugs are, um, they used to actually like keep it all in an evidence room, like that metric ton of marijuana that I seized in South Phoenix, that, that thing sat in the warehouse and they were calling me and it was a, it was in the videos under the marijuana section. If you didn't watch it, it's called uh, Darren's Drug Bus, which patrol. <coughs> Hang on. Patrol discovered it. I went out and assumed the investigation. But that metric ton sat in a warehouse and they were calling me like a year later. Like they were calling me all the time. Like, do you know where this court is or this case is in the court system? Because... This marijuana is smelling up our whole warehouse. Like we have it in a special room just because it's so strong. I mean, it was fresh marijuana from Mexico that the Jamaicans were meeting with them to buy when um, somebody got um, fed up in this condo complex and called in a complaint saying, there's a big drug deal going down right now. There's guys with guns standing around and <clears throat> cops showed up and like people were running out of the, into the desert they caught a Mexican American, they caught a Jamaican, and they caught a Mexican national. And they seized 225000 in cash. Like the, the money was there and the drugs were there, which is really rare. You have money and drugs in the same house because usually it's either money or drugs. But there was literally, and it was the champagne crew. Go watch that video. It's a really poor quality video, but it's only a couple minutes. But it was the champagne crew out of the, um, the Midwest. And they were running drugs to Michigan, Minnesota, New York, New Jersey. And it was a Jamaican drug group. And they came down to Arizona, met at a condo, were doing the drug deal. And cops showed up. They all fleed. We caught the three of them. They went to trial. The Mexican national was gone. The Jamaican test fight against the Jamaican group. And the Mexican American brought his wife and who cried and the little kid was were with him every time and they actually let him like off which blew my mind but so that marijuana sat there and smelled forever until they finally the court said okay you can take core samples to prove you know you weigh it and you take a sample to prove it was marijuana and you can dispose of the rest and they actually changed it then they actually had to get like court permission to basically just take samples of drugs then basically weigh it, take a sample and dispose of it because otherwise you'd have a warehouse like so full of drugs that, um, you'd run out of space and it, it could sit there for ever. So all the drugs that are seized, um, we have contracts with different, uh, like right now, last I knew, um, Phoenix PD has a contract with Phelps. It's called, um, Phelps mining or Phelps Dodge or something, it, but it's up in like out of town it's a mining area where they have super high they mine ore and so they have really really hot um burners that um incinerators that that burn things and so all the drugs are burned and they're they go through a filtering system to so you don't pollute the air and it's the same i think it's called phelps dodge it's like a mining company out in it's out east up there in the hills by roosevelt lake and all that but they also have contracts with hospitals. So like when you get a surgery, there's amputations, there's biohazard bags of blood and all this crazy stuff. They also burn all that up there too. <clears throat> so the drugs are burned and samples are saved until it goes to trial. 
So that's what happens to the drugs. Um, if there's something that we didn't go over in this course or in this section that you have a question about, I'm going to create, um, I'm planning on creating like a general discussion board where you can just um, ask various questions. So that's it for investigative techniques. And I hope you enjoyed this. This is the last module. And um, that's pretty much it. If you did like this course, I encourage you to um, spread the word out there and have other people sign up. And uh, this is a, again, this is the first time I have ever put this online. And so if you have any feedback for me, um, I can change it going forward. But please um, send some feedback to me on what you liked and what you didn't like. Just because um, I know it's, it's a lecture-based online format. So I don't have a lot of control there. But, you know, I tried to make it the best I could. So, all right. So I hope you benefited out of this. Don't do drugs. If you have friends or family that are involved in it, um, try to get them help. Uh, a lot of times they need that intervention. So, all right. Take care.